Great to see you all again. Are you warm enough? No. <laughs> I feel like I should have a hat on. Yeah. <laughs> I only shaved my head a few months ago because people told me I looked remarkably like Dwayne The Rock Johnson if I would cut all my hair off. Oh. And, and my head still gets really cold. I'm still, you know, I guess looking for hair back there. But uh, anyway, the I'm sure it'll warm up here in a minute because I understand the speaker is going to be producing an enormous amount of hot air. So <laughs> maybe we'll all feel better in a few minutes. Um, so welcome to our talk today, this morning, on A Brief History of China. I've handed out, and I think most of you got, a uh, chart, timeline chart, of the various imperial dynasties up until the declaration of the Republic of China in the early 20th century. Um, if you didn't get any of those, how many did not get them? Okay, I apologize. I will have some more printed and have them available to you this afternoon. I mean, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about them as we go through, but if you're interested in getting them, I'll have a few more copies this afternoon. I wasn't sure how many to actually make. Um, as I've said before, well, brief history of China today, this, this evening, uh, 5 o'clock, I will be talking about the religions of China. And during the religions of China, I will talk about, just for a min minute or two, about the national sport of Japan, which is sumo wrestling. China. Uh, China. Or, uh, China. Japan. Japan. Oh, I'm Japan. sorry. I'm sorry. You Japan. said Japan. Yes. Sorry. I mean, I'm talking about China, but I will talk about the sport of China. Uh, because somebody asked me a question yesterday about sumo wrestling. So oh. I will very briefly give you a kind of what is this with these giant men in diapers trying to throw each other around? And so we'll talk about that for just a little bit. Um, it's a fascinating sport, actually. So uh, then we'll get into the religions of China. But for right now, we want to talk about. China, the mainland of China primarily, and the history. China has, has a very old, a very long history. In fact, China is considered one of the four cradles of human civilization and culture. Generally, civilization is defined as where did they first have cities? Where did people gather together? Because by gathering in cities, that, that necessarily meant they had controlled agriculture and people develop different sort of uh, ability, production abilities, like you would have potters and you other specialties that would provide. So the four areas of the world that are considered the cradles are the Mesopotamian Valley, uh, the civilizations of ancient Sumer is probably first, then the Nile Valley, of course, in Egypt, the Indus River Valley in uh, what is now India and Pakistan, it used to be all part of India, the Indus uh, River Valley, I've done lectures on that because they've only discovered that really in the last 70 years or so, the extent to which that was a very sophisticated culture. And the fourth of those cultures is in China. The areas, at first they used to think that all of the early Chinese uh, culture was around the, the Yellow River in the north, and now they've determined that there were uh, equally developed uh, communities and culture in the southern area around the uh, Yangtze River because uh, virtually all of China has been oriented around the Yellow River or the Huanghe River in the north and the Yangtze River in the south. Because of the availability of water as necessary for human culture and civilization, um, civilizations always developed around rivers and that was true in China as well. Um, the the very, very old civilization of China makes it very difficult to talk about for 45 minutes about the history. But what I'm going to do is to try to go through some of the major points. I'm going to actually go through pretty much all of the dynasties that you've got on that chart I handed out. Some of them I'll, I'll only give you a sentence or two because all of them have something that made them significant, but some of them are much more important than others. In terms of ancient times, it's believed that there were a people living in subtle community in China as much as one million years ago. They have found stone chip tools that have been aged at 1.27 million years old. Um, we do know we have evidence of uh, millet agriculture, so that's a, a uh, controlled, settled agriculture as much as um, 8,000 BC. The earliest written Chinese language we have is on cliff writings where we have a variety of characters, which we believe was the very earliest sort of proto-Chinese language. That's from 6000 BC. And then by 5000 BC, we have evidence of very settled agriculture, of construction of buildings of various types, 
not just homes, but also gathering places and potential worship places. We have pottery developed. We have burial rituals, not, you know, not just that they got rid of the bodies, but that they had some ritual associated with that. All of those are marks of what's considered a civilized culture. Um, by the 6th century BC, they actually had developed a kind of metallurgy where they were beginning to develop um, iron tools and even blending metals in order to be able to create bronzes and other things of that sort. We, the first written records in history we have from China are from as early as 1500 BC. Now, you compare that to the fact that the, uh, the Japanese language really did not develop until almost the 10th century AD. They had been using characters from the Chinese language before that, and some of the earliest record we have of what we would consider aspects of uh, culture and civilization in Japan were not until the, uh, the third century AD. And so you're looking at uh, seven or 8,000 years earlier that we have those same kind of evidences in China. And we, in terms of a historically recorded uh, history, we have 4,000 years of history in China, which does make it one of the oldest uh, human civilizations. You'll notice uh, on this chart down here, it mentions China. In fact, this suggests China might be the oldest, 3,500 BC to 1,000 BC, then Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, and the Indus River Valley. But, the, but they're still doing, obviously, archi architectural work in architectural. Archaeological, you know, they're building too, but they're finding <laughs> things underground. Archaeological works in all of these areas, and they're still revising a lot of their understanding of what's going on. For instance, in Japan, it wasn't until after World War II that they began to discover Paleolithic, you know, early Stone Age presence of humans in Japan. And so that sort of thing is still going on. This is the chart that I have given you. I'll give you a few minutes to memorize that, and um, we'll test you on it later. This is a, a very simple kind of flow of the various uh, dynasties and empires up to the Republic of China and the People's Republic of China. And then off to the side, I think this is a wonderful chart. That's why I wanted to give you a copy of it. We have various major events that happened, uh, other kinds of activities, and it's dated along here so that you can see approximately uh, and sometimes it's difficult to say this is the year that one dynasty ended and another began because sometimes it was a process by which one dynasty would be defeated by another, etc. But this gives you a pretty good idea. The first three dynasties I'm going to lump together here in terms of uh, talking about them. They are the Sha dynasty, which is estimated to be 2070 to 1000 or to 1600 BC. The Shang Dynasty, which is 1600 to 1046, and the Zhou Dynasty, uh, which is generally considered 1046 to 221. Different scholars will give slightly different dates. As I say, it's very hard to nail that down. Um, by the way, anytime you see ZH, like tomorrow we're going to be going to Zhou Shan, ZH is pronounced J. All right, I'll give you some other clues as we go along. Uh, Q is usually pronounced like a CH like the Qing and Dynasty, Q, Q -I -N -G. Um, uh, The X is usually a Sh sound, so XIA, the first of the, of the dynasties in uh, China, is the Sha Dynasty, just to help you with that a little bit. The Sha Dynasty, we have no archaeological evidence that it ever existed, and, and uh, some, some scholars still believe that it never really was, that it was a mythical um, er, first dynasty. There are some scholars that believe that the Zhou Dynasty made up, the, because the records that we have that refer to the uh, Sha Dynasty, the earliest, are actually from the Zhou period. There are three of the early historical records that are from the Zhou period that refer to the earliest dynasty being the Sha Dynasty. Some scholars have suggested that maybe the Zhou invented the Sha Dynasty and said that the second, the Shang, conquered them in order to justify the fact they conquered the Shang. Uh, you know, we just did the same thing to them that they did to an earlier dynasty, in other words. But the, the Shah dynasty, we have no written record, we have no strong archaeological record. What we have are historical writings that refer to it um, in three cases. The bamboo annals, uh, there's a, the uh, classic of history is a second document, and then the records of the grand historian, all from the Zhou dynasty, that talk about the early Shah. But we really don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, at some point, we may find archaeological proof. It's astonishing how many different major 
kingdoms in history have thought to have been made up um, initially until they found evidence. The Hittite Empire, you've heard of the Hittite Empire, which was in Asia Minor, right? For centuries, historians thought that was all just made up. There wasn't really a Hittite Empire. And then all of a sudden they found in one location, which had been the capital of the Hittite Empire, over 10,000 documents you know, on um, permanent, you know, like on clay document uh, tablets and things like that. And since then, they have uncovered a massive amount to show that the Hittite Empire was a major force. In fact, the, the primary um, challenger to the authority of the Egyptian Empire. And so, it may be that tomorrow we find evidence that the Shah Empire really did exist. For now, we are basing that on written uh, histories from later on. The second empire, the uh, the Shang Empire, we do have very strong uh, archaeological evidence, and it particularly comes in the form of what are called oracle bones. Um, in the 19th century, it was discovered that various uh, Chinese medicine doctors were taking these old bones or old uh, tortoise shells. This is a plastron, which means the bottom shell of a turtle, which is flatter, of course, and that had writing on it and they were grinding it up to make um, traditional medicines. Well, once they realized that, they started looking at this and discovered that this is some of the earliest records, the, the scratched uh, writing on these plastrons of tortoises or on the scapula of oxes, the next biggest bone that they had, uh, scapula being the shoulder blade of an ox, and that they, what they would do, they've since discovered, because they have now found over 100,000 of these, you know, there is significant evidence, it's not just one or two pieces, where the, uh, during the Shang period, they would scratch a question to the gods on these plastrons or on these ox uh, shoulder blades. They would then drill a hole next to the question and heat it until the shell cracked along that hole. And the shamans, the, the people who were supposed to be gifted at this would read the cracks. It was a kind of, of um, what's the word, fortune telling almost, where they would determine from the cracks what the God's answer to the question was. And then frequently, the person that did the interpretation, once the thing cooled off, they would write the response right next to what the question was. And we have these plastrons and ox shoulder blades now. We, I don't have any, but they have them in China. <laughs> that um, have a great deal of information. In fact, we have learned a lot about the religion, the culture, the economy, because the questions could be anything about, um, is my millet crop going to do well this year? So we know they grew millet, you know. Um, is, the, is the government going to refund my taxes this year? And so we knew that there was a tax system. That kind of thing has given us an enormous amount of information about the Shang Dynasty. So these oracle bones have been a critical part of understanding the ancient history of the Shang Dynasty. Um, the, the, the Shang also, um, well, I won't spend a lot of time on that. I could, I could talk a lot more about some of these older ones. The Zhou Dynasty, which is the next one I want to mention, um, was from 1046 to 221 BC. It is the longest lasting of all of the Chinese dynasties. Um, and the Zhou Dynasty is particularly important because it introduced a concept which has lasted throughout all of the imperial history of China, and that is the Mandate of Heaven. During the Zhou period, um, they developed the idea that the emperor, the one who was in charge, although it wasn't a true emperor in terms of over all of China or over all of it, there were still independent kingdoms around, so it's not called an empire yet, but the idea that the ruler was a ruler because of the mandate of heaven, that heaven had decided that he was going to be in charge and that he would continue to have the mandate of heaven on his side until he lost a major battle or was overthrown by somebody. It was sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy then. Obviously, he doesn't have the mandate of heaven anymore or he would still be in charge. But this idea that it wasn't just human will that was causing a person to be in charge of the imperial government, of the Chinese government, but rather that it truly was heaven. Now that's not quite the same as divine rights of kings in Europe because it wasn't one God that was doing this. Heaven represents all of the spiritual powers, you know, and that, that all, that they were, uh, the leader was the choice of all of the divine spirits. Um, that was the mandate of heaven and that became very important later on. Uh, 
Late in the, the Zhou Dynasty, unfortunately, they began to lose control, as often happens. You'll see it. in China, it's almost always a case of them having a very settled government, followed by a period of real upheaval and rebellion and revolt, followed by someone taking charge and having a settled period, followed by a time of revolt. It's almost always this up and down kind of thing in Chinese history. Toward the end of the Zhou Dynasty, we went through two periods called the spring and autumn period. It's called that because the history of that time is called the spring and autumn annals. Frequently they would name these periods based upon uh, the histories that were written about them. Late at the end of the spring and autumn period, and it was when it's basically a record of things falling apart in the Zhou dynasty. And then we have also uh, the next period, still within the Zhou timeline, uh, is the warring states period in which various parts of the Zhou uh, dynasty started to break off and create their own little kingdoms under warlords and declaring themselves king. Um, but still, for all of that, this period of time, particularly the spring and autumn period and the warring states period at the end of the Zhou era, uh, were a time when they really developed some, uh, it was the highest point perhaps of all of the Chinese bronze making. Um, they really refined the script that they used in that time, so it was a very important time in terms of development of the culture. And by the way, if, you, if I ever say something that makes no sense whatsoever, or you have a burning question that cannot wait until the end of the talk, do feel free to ask me. You know, yell at me, throw something at me, do whatever you have to to get my attention, because I'm open to answering you know, occasional questions as we go along. I can't do a lot of that. Yes? Right. There, there is a, a great flood legend that is part of the, uh, the Shah uh, dynasty. In fact, the Shah dynasty, one of the reasons they think it might be mythical is because the histories say that it was begun by the, one of the legendary first five kings. And those were considered to be legendary figures, not really historical figures. And so that's why some historians question that. And they also have, as many cultures do, a flood legend. Sounds like the Bible. Very much. I mean, the biblical, the biblical flood, uh, Noah, and all of that. There are cultures in in Mesoamerica and South America. There are cultures in Asia, including the the early Sha, which have similar legends of the flood. Okay, there there are Mesopotamian legends of the flood uh, as well. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh and others make reference to it. So um, this very cheery looking fellow is. <laughs> Uh, Chen Shi Wang Di. His actual name was Zhang, but he ended up, um, he was at the, the, he created the Qin Empire. The Qin Empire is one of the most important because this is the first imperial empire. He was the first one to name himself emperor. In fact, Wang Di is a title, which Shi Wang Di, which means first emperor. And Wang Di, as the title of emperor, was continued from that point on throughout all of the history of, of dynastic uh, imperial China. He was the one that took over, control, you know, defeated everybody under the warring states, expanded the area. So he is considered the very first of the emperors. And again, he named himself the first emperor. Um, he did an enormous amount in a very short period of time. In fact, the Qin Dynasty only lasted 15 years. The dates that, uh, oh, you can't even see it because the screen's not down far enough. The dates I have on here are 259 to 210 BC, but though that was his lifespan. He was only, the Qin Dynasty was only 15 years, um, and so he and his son were the only Qin emperors. But when um, Qin Shi Huangdi took over, he standardized the currency, he standardized all the weights and measures, he created a uniform writing system. He developed the most modern military with modern weapons and tactics that was available in the world at that time. Now, he was very, um, he used the principle, and we'll talk about this under the religions this afternoon, of legalism. The legalism is, by definition, is a matter of tight control, that there are very clear rules, and if you violate the rules, there is very clear and very severe consequences. And, We'll talk about that as a philosophy, sort of a philosophy religion, but um, Shi Wang Di really instituted that. Tradition says he was very heavy-handed, that he really, which he almost had to be, to defeat all of the other parts of the Warring uh, Kingdoms era. Um, the 
the legend is, and you'll even see pictures of this, and you'll hear read references of this, that in order to try to suppress records of past dynasties, or anybody before him, and in order to control uh, what was being said and done in his kingdom, that he had books, that he did a massive book burning, and that he buried scholars alive. Now, modern research suggests that that didn't really happen, but it's a reflection of the fact that he had a, a uh, he was understood to be very tight-fisted in terms of his control. Um, so between 210 and his death in, um, I mean, up to his death in 210, the period of time that he served, and then his young son was put on the throne, and it did not last. Interestingly, he is the guy that created the Terracotta Warriors. It is the tomb of um, Chen Shi Wang Di. He had this, this obsession about living forever. And so he had this massive, this city-sized mausoleum built for himself and created literally an entire army of soldiers, every one of whom, these are life-size, created in terracotta, every one of them has a different face. And it's believed that it probably, they actually modeled each one of these after a real soldier in, in the army, because they all look different. Um, he has horses, you know, full-size uh, terracotta horses. He has chariots. He has all manner of things in there. He has a uh, layout of, um, sort of a paradise with mercury flowing as the rivers and quite extraordinary but his fascination with eternal life not only caused him to create a, a mausoleum which would be for him the assurance that he would have an army to serve him in the afterlife etc and a, an extraordinary palace to live in which is what the mausoleum ended up looking like but he ended up trying to have his various doctors and uh, wise men in his court help him try to find a way to achieve eternal life. And so they were always coming up with these, um, these remedies that they thought would extend his life. Well, for a period of time, one of his guys was giving him a remedy that involved putting mercury in the food. And so he died at 49 from mercury poisoning because he was trying to achieve eternal life. Um, fascinating guy, but he really set the stage. In fact, Chen, this short-lived empire, which was the first imperial uh, dynasty, is the source of the Western name for China. Uh, that's where we get it, is from the Chen uh, dynasty, all right? One of the other things that he was responsible for was extending, prior to him, as um, earlier, 100 years or so earlier, various of these warring states groups had created walls, barriers, to protect themselves either from one another or from the north, in the north of China, there were various nomadic tribes, the Mongols, we find out about later, but there were Huns, there was a group called the Xiongnu, that I'll talk about when we talk about the Han Dynasty. And um, Wang Di went in and took these various walls and connected them, so he is considered the first architect of the Great Wall of China. I'm going to do a talk in a couple of days about the Great Wall of China. We'll get into a little more detail about that. But he had these massive works done, including the construction of the Great Wall. And you'll notice that the Great Wall always, it's, it's in the north, and it's intended to, to protect or separate the kingdom of, of Qin from the northern areas where the barbarians um, live, the various Mongol tribes, the nomadic tribes. And here you get an image of, of what that sort of looked like. There were pieces of wall before, but he built them up and connected them. And then this is by no means the end of it. They continued to add various dynasties added to the uh, Great Wall until the Ming Dynasty. Most of the images that you see of this massive stone walls with uh, watchtowers every, you know, every quarter mile or something, almost all of that was built by the Ming Dynasty which is the next to the last of the imperial dynasties, 1500s. Um, and yet, it began all the way back in the Qin dynasty. So, we can thank uh, Qin Shi Wang Di for that. Next comes one of the very most important of the dynasties, uh, important of the dynasties, which is the Han dynasty from 206 BC to 220 AD. So, for about 426 years, um, it is considered the golden age of Chinese history. It is the period of time in which China became 
known to the rest of the world in a way that it hadn't been before. Um, even today, the majority of Chinese refer to themselves, the largest ethnic group in China, they refer to themselves as Han Chinese because of the Han Dynasty. And in fact, the script that they have in China, is called, they're called Han characters. So this is very much seen as kind of the center point of the history. Um, it was the Han that really did extensive battles with some of these northern nomads. There was a particular tribe called the Zhongnu. They were uh, nomadic raiders in the north. Um, at first they were separate tribes, but then a leader came along. I'm going to talk about this under the Silk Road discussion, uh, the lecture. Um, a leader came along called Modu Changnu, and he, he unified the Zhongnu, and the Zhongnu actually ended up defeating Han China for a little while and forced the Han Chinese uh, government to treat them as equals. They also drove some of the other uh, tribes out. There was a group called the, the Weizi that I'll mention in just a second, that was driven to the west by the Zhongnu because they had been hated enemies of theirs. So this is when the northern um, nomadic tribes really began to make their presence known. Later on, of course, um, Chinggis Khan, one of the, uh, from the Mongol peoples in the north, ended up creating the greatest contiguous empire in the history of the world. The British Empire was actually larger, but it was spread out all over the world. And uh, Chinggis Khan and his sons and grandsons from these northern nomadic peoples created the largest empire in the world. And we'll talk about that. But the Han time was time of great economic prosperity, great advances in science, uh, technology, and mathematics. The um, paper making was invented then. The ship making was a huge thing. They invented the steering rudder for ships. They, in mathematics, they were the one, first ones to create negative numbers. And all the theoretical work that be, can be done with negative numbers in mathematics. So they were very significant. Perhaps most of all, they were responsible for creating what became known as the Silk Road. The Emperor of China selected a nobleman whose name was Jian Qin. Jian Qin was sent on a trip. Because the Zhongnu were threatening Han China, the Wei Zi was another tribe that had been driven west, but they were very powerful as well. The emperor sent uh, Jian Qin to find the Wei Zi and ask them to come back and join with China in order to fight the Zhongnu. Well, he found them, but they didn't want to come back. They ended up later on uh, migrating all the way down into northern India, and we'll get into that under the Silk Roads as well. But in the process of traveling to the West, where no other Chinese diplomats had ever been, he, um, uh, John Chen, discovered all of these other countries in Central Asia. In fact, he even saw evidence of the Roman Empire. And so he had stories, although he didn't get that far himself, of various other powerful empires that were further to the West. And his first trip took 10 years because he got captured by the, the Zhongnu, and they took them. That's what, that's what um, this is all about. This was Longchang was the capital for them. So he's traveling, he gets captured, taken up there, and lives there for 10 years. He's, he marries, has children, and finally, after 10 years, decides, maybe I should escape. <laughs> so he goes back to, to the emperor, and after 10 years, he brings the first uh, developed report, the first accurate and reliable report of what things were like to the west of Imperial China. That then later led to the development, the opening of the Silk Road, which is, again, I'm going to do a talk entirely about this, but the Silk Road was a network, it wasn't one road, but it was a network of trading uh, routes that started over in China, traveled up and around the, the Tarim Basin, which is the um, Taklamakan Desert, and then connected all the way over to Byzantium, Constantinople, throughout all of down into India, and later on, after the, the land routes, they started wanting to transport ceramics and other things that were heavy, and that didn't go on camels very well, and so they developed water routes as well. This is considered the most important communication network in the history of humankind because not only did it allow silks and ceramics and spices and things like that from the east to be taken to the west, the Mediterranean, but likewise vegetables that didn't exist in Asia were brought, cucumbers and all sorts of other things. And most importantly, it became the route by which various cultures exchanged understanding. 
Um, you learn, they learned of other languages, and particularly they learned of other religions. This was the route by which Buddhism came from India to China, and then from China to Korea, and then to Japan. Uh, it was along these Silk Road routes because these people, the traders, would bring their beliefs and their culture and their learning with them. Literature was, was delivered, various technologies. Later on, although they kept it a secret for a long time, they eventually discovered how to make silk in the West that had been a secret in China. But paper making, gunpowder, uh, mo movable type print, all of these kinds of things were communicated via the Silk Road. It was very powerful. So now I don't have to do that lecture later on. Right? <laughs> we'll, we'll get into more detail then. We then, after the Han Dynasty, things again began to fall apart um, as they almost inevitably did. Oh, by the way, one thing I do need to tell you, the name Silk Road was not coined until the 19th century. And the, the traveler and uh, the, the historian who, who quoted the term Silk Road, which is what everyone uses now, was Ferdinand von Richthofen. You know the name von Richthofen? He was the uncle of Baron von Richthofen, the Red Baron who was the, the World War I German ace, okay? Just had to throw that little factoid in there. So at the end of the Han period, there was civil war and internal conflict, and it developed into three kingdoms. It's called the Three Kingdoms period. The kingdoms of Wu, Wei, and Shu Han. Um, it's not really accurate in one way to call them kingdoms because all three of the rulers of those nations called themselves emperor. All three of the leaders of those three nations claimed that they were the legitimate heir to the Han emperor. Uh, so in one way we could call it the three empires. But eventually the kingdom of Wei conquered Shu and then the Jin dynasty, which is the next dynasty, ended up conquering both Wei and the Wu and creating one. But this was perhaps the bloodiest period in all of Chinese history. For all of the various times they had rebellion and revolution, to give you an idea, a census had been done, and we, we wonder how accurate these censuses were back then. You know, it's not like they could, they could email their data or anything of that sort. But prior to the, three, the end of the Three Kingdoms period, uh, well, prior to the start of the Three Kingdoms period, there was a census that had declared that there were 56.5 million people and 16.2 million households in what had been the Han Empire, so 56 million people. At the end of the Three Kingdoms, the Jin Dynasty did another census and survey, and instead of 56.5 million people, they identified 16.2. So it went from 56 to 16 million people. And it went from 16.2 um, million households to, I'm, I'm sorry, from 10.7 uh, million households to 2.5 million households. So it was a horrendously bloody time. People died not only from direct con uh, conflict, but from famine, disease, various other side effects from uh, periods of war. And so it was a very bad time. But still, for all of that, there was considerable technological advantage during that time. They invented a magnetic compass. They invented new means of irrigation. They invented what they called a wooden ox which was a wheelbarrow. And if you think about it, how extraordinarily innovative a wheelbarrow would be if you need to move a pile of dirt, right? <laughs> or anything else, practically. And so there was significant technological advantage there. But the next empire, the one that conquered the Three Kingdoms, was the Jin Dynasty. It lasted for only about 140 years. Um, it was marked from the very start by various succession crises, civil war, invasion, in fact, there are subsets within the Jin Dynasty, and this is on your chart, like the period of the five barbarians. Five different foreign nations invaded the Jin Empire then and set up their own little ruling areas. Those were called the five barbarians. Later on, they ended up slowly being kind of assimilated into the Chinese. It's also a period toward the end called the 16 Kingdoms period because eventually it broke up into multiple various kingdoms. But even then, for all of the short period of time, 100, uh, 140 years, and the, the difficulties that they had, they did have innovation that came along. For instance, this is the period of time in which they invented the stirrup. If you can imagine what it would have been to be a warrior on horseback, and because of the nomadic tribes in the north you know, being horsemen, that was how they were so successful. They were fast and, and very effective because they were horsemen. If you can imagine riding a horse into battle with somebody else trying to kill you without stirrups versus what it would be like to do that with stirrups so that you can control yourself on the horse, 
Uh, it was a huge innovation, especially for military reasons. So the uh, Jin Dynasty lasted for about 140 years, and again, following that, there was a period which is called the Northern and Southern Kingdoms, in which at first it broke into two major kingdoms, the Northern Wei and the Luisong, and then later there were multiple kingdoms, all within this time period, the Northern and Southern Kingdoms, which was about, 100, about 170 years. Um, the Still, for this time, there was a flourishing of arts, of culture, of technology, especially this was a time when there was a widespread expansion of Mahayana Buddhism. You will remember, the original Buddhism that was presented by the Katama Buddha in India was Theravada Buddhism, or the School of the Elders. Mahayana, or Great Vehicle Buddhism, was the one that incorporates all those other styles that primarily came in once Buddhist, uh, Buddhism left India. It, it includes Pure Land Buddhism, um, the Zen Buddhism, various other Shingon, uh, Nichiren, various other kinds of Buddhism. And in China, they developed some of their own distinctive styles of Buddhism that were really spreading during this time. It's also the time that Taoism became a major force. We'll talk about Taoism this afternoon in our uh, Religions of China talk. The Northern and Southern Kingdom period was overcome by the Sui Dynasty. The Sui Dynasty was very short-lived, but it was considered very important as a pivotal time. There were a number of reforms that were introduced during the short Sui Dynasty, including equal field systems, where people were given allotments of a certain amount of land and given the freedom to grow that, so initiative increased and food production increased. There was a massive increase in the production of rice during this period of time, and as a result, there was a massive increase in population. The increase in the availability of food is almost always the primary thing that leads to increases in population. And that was very much the case here. Uh, again, an encouragement of Buddhism during this period of time. The Sui Dynasty was also significant because it, it was during this period that they created the first parts of the Grand Canal. It was a canal that connected the north and the south, and sort of, you know, northeast, southwest kind of uh, parts of China so that they could transport goods internally, domestically. Prior to that, they had the Yellow River, or the Huanghe River, and they had the Yangtze River. But apart from that, it was just a big gap in between, and they created this canal to allow them to have domestic trade in other directions. But late in the Sui Dynasty, they had a series of disasters. Um, there were um, they tried to attack Korea several times, the kingdom of Goryeo, which became Korea later, and they were defeated uh, desperately. Then later on, they um, suffered from, well, the heavy taxation, the compulsory projects, because they forced people to work on things like the Grand Canal. They ended up having a number of different kinds of revolts, and the Sui Dynasty was overthrown because of that. In fact, the emperor at that time was killed. This led us to, again, one of the very important um, dynasties, which is the Tang Dynasty, which lasted for almost 300 years. And you will notice that the Tang Dynasty recovered much of what had been the Han Dynasty. This is the area of the Tarim Basin, which was critical for the Silk Road, because the routes went through this, uh, which is, there's a, a corridor here, the Ganji Corridor, and then on either side of the desert, the Takamakan Desert in the Hiram Basin. And so they ended up taking control of that under the Tang Dynasty. It, like the Han Dynasty, is considered a high point in Chinese civilization. It was the golden age of cosmopolitan culture. The capital city of Chang'an of the Tang Dynasty was the most populous city in the world at that time. Um, they, it really did rival the Han Dynasty in, some, in terms of their sophistication. The Han Dynasty is considered the high point for all that they did. The population at this point had grown to about 80 million people, and 80 million people meant that they could develop armies of several hundred thousand soldiers, which gave them the ability to fight back against some of the nomadic tribes and others that were in Central Asia and in the North. Um, it was also a very, at uh, this time, was very powerful in terms of cultural influence on Japan, on Korea and on Vietnam. It was during the Tang Dynasty that a lot of the principles that got transferred to Japan in terms of how they ran the government and things came from that. Lots of innovations during this time, both woodblock printing and the beginning of movable type printing, which came began to be developed. It was actually in the, the 10th, 11th centuries that, that movable type. Now we think of Gutenberg, right? Uh, 1500s. 
China invented it at least four to five hundred years before that. Um, but they, so they, all of this innovation, there were a spread of native Chinese sects of Buddhism, which took with it a lot of the culture that had come from the, uh, the West. But unfortunately, toward the end of the Tang Dynasty, there began to be a state persecution of Buddhism. And that continued after the Tang Dynasty even, and that led, that's why today, Buddhism is not as common in China as it is in some of the other East Asian countries. Because while it had been a, a, a very important part of the culture and the flourishing of the, the beliefs, later on, Buddhism was persecuted by the state and ended up really falling, uh, falling away. So that there's not a lot of Buddhism in China. Well, because of communist mainland China, there's not a lot of religion. Why was it persecuted? Well, they determined that, uh, as often happened, that the Buddhist monks started trying to take too much power. Um, this, this happened in Japan as well. Uh, the, that's why the Meiji uh, Restoration in Japan tried to suppress Buddhism. At first they tried to just limit it, and then later they actually tried to eradicate it because they felt that the Buddhists were, Buddhist monks were gaining too much power. Uh, uh, similar stories happen in various nations in Europe with the Catholic Church. You know, this, is, this has not been uncommon. Okay. Afterwards, again, remember, time of real stability. Tang Dynasty is a great example of that. And then we have a time of great upheaval. In the 10th century, the five dynasties and 10 kingdoms period, everything fell apart. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 960, the uh, Song Dynasty comes in as they gain control after the five dynasties and 10 kingdoms which is just the, the, the Chinese have a way of naming things that are quite, that they'll usually just describe the characteristics. Okay, during this time there were five dynasties and ten kingdoms. So the era is called five dynasties and ten kingdoms or three kingdoms or whatever. The Song Dynasty gained control after that, that time of upheaval. They featured a very vibrant social life. The cities all developed uh, quarters for entertainment. There were a lot of social clubs. There were uh, gathering places. People um, had a very active social life, a lot of artwork, a lot of culture was developed during the Song Dynasty. During the Song Dynasty is the first time anybody had paper money. They no longer were printing coinage, and you've seen some of the old coins, you know, that were round with a square hole in the middle so you could put them on the string. Well, they had had coinage before that, but this is the first time anybody produced paper money. They had the first standing navy in the history of, uh, of China. They had the first known use of gunpowder and the first magnetic compass that allowed them to quickly identify true north, which was critically important once you have a standing navy. You know, you've got ships that are going out. You need to, you know, to determine direction, knowing north is critically important. In the 10th and 11th centuries, the population of China doubled because of their success in agriculture during this time, especially expanded rice cultivation. They had other crops as well. But then in 1271, which was late in, in the, the Song Dynasty, the 13th century or the 1200s is when the Mongol um, armies, first under Chinggis Khan, then under his sons and grandsons, ended up conquering all the way to Poland. I mean, quite literally, they got into Eastern Europe and everything in between. Well, by the time, uh, by 1271, the grandson of Chinggis Khan, Kublai Khan, had conquered some of the northern area of the Song Dynasty and he declared himself to be the emperor of China at that point, uh, a little premature. But just a few years later in 1279, they actually had conquered all of the Song Dynasty and Kublai Khan became the, um, the emperor of what was called the Wan Dynasty, which was a Mongol dynasty, the only time in history that a non-Chinese power ruled all of China. This is what the Mongol Empire looked like after the death of um, Genghis Khan, or Genghis Khan. Um, remember I told you the language had changed? And they, they spell things differently now because they're using pinyin transliteration instead of the uh, Wade Giles? Well, what we used to call Genghis Khan is more appropriately Chinggis Khan. That is a better, better representation of how it should be pronounced, so Genghis Khan. When he died, he had four heirs, sons and grandsons, that created the four major empires. In the north, uh, northern Asia, and into Russia, there was the Golden Horde. It actually was broken up into a couple of different subsets, like the Blue Horde uh, was part of that. 
you had the Ilkhanate down in Persia, which is the, the leader, the heir to Genghis Khan who led that, was willing to be subordinate to the Great Khan because always after the death of Genghis Khan, one of them would be named the Great Khan, the one that's supposed to be in charge. Ilkhanate means subordinate. So the Ilkhanate um, down in Persia and this area of Persia, Iraq, was um, the Ilkhanate. You then have the Chagatai Khanate in the middle, named after one of his sons, Chagatai. And then the Khanate of the Great Khan, because the fourth of the Great Khans after Chinggis Khan was Kublai Khan, who is his grandson. Kublai Khan was named the Great Khan, and all the other three were supposed to be subordinate to him, but by this time they really weren't. You know, they might be for a while and then they go off on their own because they were quite a distance away. So they're controlling all of Asia, all the way over into uh, Eastern Europe. And Kublai Khan ended up conquering all of China and he chose to create a Chinese style dynasty. Not to turn it into a Mongol kingdom, but for him to become emperor of a Chinese kingdom. And that was in 1279 and we have the creation of the Huan Dynasty, 1279 to 1368. This was the period of time in which the Mongols were still trying to conquer other areas. They tried to invade twice into Japan, for instance, and both times they were defeated by typhoons. Well, generally they say one of them was a typhoon and one of them was a, just a massive rainstorm, uh, you know, a, a massive storm. Well, if it's a storm big enough to destroy a navy, I'd call it a typhoon. Uh, so they, uh, they were unable to conquer Japan, but pretty much everything else during this time they were able to conquer. And he did create a Chinese-style um, dynasty. Over time, as always happened, they weakened. They ended up only being able to control the, control the northern part of the country, and it became known as the Northern Yuan. And we then have one of the more famous of the dynasties, the Ming Dynasty, comes along in 1368. This was one, uh, historians have called this, and I quote here, one of the greatest eras of orderly government and social stability in history. 276 years of the Ming Dynasty, and you know about Ming vases and various other kinds of beautiful things that came out of the Ming period. It was the last imperial dynasty that was run by Han Chinese. There's only one more dynasty after this, the Qing Dynasty, and it was actually run by Manchu, that is the, the Yurkan uh, peoples out of Manchuria. This was the last Han Chinese dynasty, meaning of the Han people. Um, here they had a standing army during the Ming period of over one million. You know, the population is one of the things that China has always had in terms of military. Uh, the Nanjing shipyards during the, the Ming dynasty were the largest shipyards in the world. And with, this was the period of time, particularly in the 1500s, when the Ming dynasty launched the treasure ships, which I'm gonna be doing a talk about. Um, these giant ships that traveled over, some people say over the entire world, some even say they got to North America. Um, we'll talk about that in our, our discussion. There was, at this point, a number of European powers came in, the Portuguese, the Dutch, um, the Spanish came in and they had extensive trading, uh, trading during this time, so that meant a lot of new products coming into Japan, a lot of, or Japan, to China, a lot of Chinese products products being uh, sent to Western Europe, and an enormous amount of uh, hard currency, particularly silver, coming into Ming China, so that they were very rich at that point. Toward the end of the Ming Dynasty, they had a series of disasters. They had what was called the Little Ice Age in the uh, early 1600s, meaning a uh, reduction of temperature, which really limited the growing seasons. And again, it's the ability to grow the food that maintains the population. So they ended up having crop failures. During that same time, they had floods and epidemics that eventually led to the fall of the Ming Dynasty and the start of the last of the Imperial Dynasties, which are the Qing Dynasty. The Qing Dynasty, 1944 to 1911. Um, during the Qing Dynasty, which was controlled by a different ethnic group, these are the Manchus, or the Jurkins, they, out of, out of Manchuria, um, they suffered uh, two losses to Great Britain under the Opium Wars, which we will talk about in a later conversation. They suffered under various Western powers, what were called the Unequal Treaties period, where these military forces would come in with their gunboats and they had much more advanced military and they would force the Chinese 
to open their ports or any any of you know Britain would say any of our people who live in your country are not subject to your laws they can't be prosecuted by you only we can prosecute them for something a lot of things that were very unequal so it's the unequal uh, treaties period a number of their ports ended up being controlled by foreign powers in 1900 they had the boxer rebellion which was an anti-foreign rebellion by it's called the boxers because the group that started it were a martial arts group and when they were practicing their martial arts the westerners who saw them said it looked like they were boxing and that's where they got the boxer rebellion because it started with that martial arts uh, society but the boxer rebellion um, westerners were killed christianity was persecuted and to stop the boxer rebellion eight major nations created an eight nation uh, alliance it included all the Western powers plus Japan came into uh, China in order to stop this rebellion which the Chinese government the Qing dynasty government was not able to stop and many of them ended up sticking around this is why Britain controlled Hong Kong for so long this is um, the Russians left their troops in Manchuria and they controlled Manchuria for a long time after the the Russian Japanese war and they Japanese defeated the Russians they took over Manchuria where when the Russians left because the Russians had been there since the Boxer Rebellion so various countries are just taking over pieces of China under the Qing Dynasty um, the various that weakness the inability to even defend themselves plus the fact that there was uh, an, an inability socially and militarily for the court of the Qing Dynasty to improve to modernize to advance every effort that was made to try to advance the country got suppressed by the court which is why they ended up losing uh, the first sino-japanese war to japan to, to everyone's surprise because they had been unsuccessful in modernizing um, eventually there was an uprising against them primarily by intellectuals by young military officers and by students there was the wuchang uprising which led to the shinhai um, revolution and the last Chinese emperor, who was Pu Yi, abdicated on February 12th of 1912 in favor of the Republic of China. They created a republic. I've already talked about this a little bit. I'm going to quickly go over this. Um, see where we are. Okay. Um, the Republic of China in 1911 was declared. Sun Yat-sen was the first president. He got pushed out of power by the guy that was in charge of the army, who then tried to make himself emperor. Sun Yat-sen uh, Yat then created a new alternate government, a political party, in, um, called the Kuomintang, or the Nationalist Party. Later on taken over by Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek, unlike Sun Yat-sen, did not like the communists, and so he forced them out of the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party, and they started a civil war over that. Again, I talked about that at length in uh, another conversation. I'm not going to go through all of that again. But eventually, you know, they fought the war until 1937, and then there was a united front where the Chinese Communists and the Nationalist Party joined together to fight the Japanese who had invaded. And they, they kept that up until 1945 when the Japanese were defeated, and then between 45 and 49, the Chinese Civil War picked up again. Eventually, although they'd started out way behind, the Chinese Communist Party, the CPC, ended up defeating the nationalists, Kuomintang under Chiang Kai-shek, Chiang Kai-shek and his people, seven million of them, ended up moving to Taiwan. And on October 1st of 1949, Mao Zedong, the leader of the Communist Party of China, declared the new People's Republic of China. So that's why we have two Chinas today, as I'm sure you all were in my talk earlier. Um, this is China as we know it today. Taiwan, of course, is a separate nation. This little island where we were is the Republic of China. This is all the People's Republic of China, and which is predominantly communist. But in recent times, <coughs> particularly under, uh, um, well, some of the more recent leaders, uh, there are several of them, they did a massive uh, revision of the economic policies, especially uh, the well, and they ended up making it not a, a on-demand economy, as they call it, where the central government's calling all the shots, but rather a modified mix, what they call market socialism. <coughs> and 
um, obviously they have become a significant economic powerhouse. Okay, history of China. Any questions about any of that? <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> Sorry. Questions? Sure. No questions. And there they said stunned. Okay, in the front here and then behind. Yes. The Cultural Revolution was 1962 to 60, well, no, the Great Leap Forward was 62 to 65. The Great Leap Forward was an effort by Mao Zedong to radically change China so that it would become more of a manufacturing, less of an agrarian. So what he did was he, co he collectivized all of the farms, private farming was not allowed, to try to, to, try to farm privately or to sell things privately. Um, the sentence was execution. 45 million people died during the Great Leap Forward, either from famine, because they actually reduced the production. They were taking farmers off of the land, that, you know, because they were focusing some of them on collectivized farms, but the ones they took off the land, they were putting them in charge of uh, factories, when they did not know how to run factories. They ended up producing a massive amount of what's called pig iron, because it was so poorly produced, it was useless. Um, and so the whole industrialized effort of the Great Leap Forward was a failure. And then later, 65 to 68, um, 65, 66 uh, in that period, was the Cultural Revolution in which Mao Zedong actually had been blamed for the failure of the Great Leap Forward and had been kind of marginalized. A lot of people don't realize that. But he ended up regaining some of his power and he came back and launched the Cultural Revolution because he said the reason this didn't work is because westernized capitalism has infected us and we need to get rid of that and we need to forget all of the things that have come before and all of the influences around the world and we need to make sure that we are a pure communist society which meant they destroyed a lot of the artifacts from the past. What a very